where we breathe life back into your organization, projects, and processes, giving you insights to recovery and avoiding corporate mortality events. Today, we'll be talking about navigating the culture wars, and joining us to contribute to the conversation is Jim Terry. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Jim. Hi, Jana. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Good to be here. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about your background with the audience? Sure. You know, I um, stumbled into the political realm uh, nearly 30 years ago now, and, and throughout the course of, of those three decades, I've done just about everything uh, you can do under the sun. Uh, I've been a campaign manager. I've worked at party committees. Um, I've run uh, the third party organizations. Um, but, you know, for the last 15 years or so, we've, we've taken sort of all of those skills and begun to apply them to helping corporations, uh, trade associations, and non nonprofits um, navigate the environment, the political terrain, which is, as you know, is constantly changing. And, you know, ultimately what we do is to help people understand the environment they're operating in um, and understand how their story fits into that environment and how to and help people tell their stories. And so, you know, um, it, it is really, I think, important conversation because we, we, you know, I think there's probably many companies that aren't sure, you know, what to do or they go down one direction and then they change when that backfires. So um, probably definitely good to go in with a plan. But um, I kind of would like to start with understanding when did companies become more, I guess, um, embedded in the social world, you know, uh, you know, I don't think it used to be so um, tied to social causes other than maybe a, a yearly mar um, participation in a, you know, March for Dimes or something. So when did, when did all of this start to really um, uh, gain momentum? I, I blame Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey. Um, mm. You know, in, 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 in truth, though, I do think social media you know, the, the social media environment um, has uh, really contributed to, to this moment. But I also think you can't escape or, you know, can't get around the, the role that college campuses have played in this, um, in which, you know, these, uh, the kind of political, uh, the way in which issues are kind of presented and often viewed through a moral lens. It's not that you have, you um, policy disagreements is I'm right. And if you don't disagree with me, you're evil. And that kind of binary creates a, how do you, how do you accept someone who's evil? How do you, you know, respect their opinion? And, and you have kind of these generations of, of young people that have come out of that. And along the way, they've kind of come to uh, believe that it is the duty of these corporations to, to fight evil. And um, so you have a lot of these corporations are dealing with both external pressures where external um, actors are pressing them to take the field, but a lot of them find themselves hostage to their own workforce where that, that pressure is coming internally as well. And then you throw a social media digital environment where everyone has Twitter, everyone has a video camera in their pocket, everyone has a voice. Uh, it kind of starts to really kind of kind of amp up. And then, of course, you throw the national media and Hollywood kind of an environment in there that is really approving and supporting and kind of uh, pressuring in that in that direction. It, it really, uh, you know, has spun up quite quickly, to be honest, uh, the degree of pressure on the on these corporations. And we're now kind of seeing the other side of that coin. Yeah, I think for, for quite a while, the big corporations uh, paid not too much penalty. You know, as long as they stuck with the dominant narrative, there wasn't too much of a penalty. In it. But I think, you know, what was going on with Disney uh, down in Florida now has the CEOs and C-suites kind of recognizing that, hang on a minute, there, there may be some cost here. I mean, because this is going to be tremendously costly to, to Disney. Um, aside from the you know the specific policies down around there in Florida, whatever benefits they had, taxation or whatever, <clears throat> uh, you know, copyrights aren't forever, and you know it's been customary that every every couple of years Congress passes an extension on the copyrights that have long expired for Mickey Mouse and a lot of a lot of these old you know trademarks that they have. And, you know, if Congress does not renew that, you know, next year when it's due, that's another billion dollar hit to them. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, there's now kind of 
uh, another side of the coin emerging on this, and we'll see how that how that plays out. Yeah, you you touched um, touched on quite a few things. That I'd like to ask follow up on, but you know, the first kind of base question I would would be kind of curious of is, do you think it's dangerous if um, a company tries to stay without a stance? Like, do they have to have an opinion or what happens if, is it just equally as bad to not have an opinion as to have the quote unquote wrong opinion? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, it's as with most things in this realm, it context matters. Uh, you know, for instance, what industry are you, are you in? What does your workforce look like? What does your customer base look like? Um, you know, and, and there's also a, a, a size issue here. You know, if you're, you know, Walt Disney, you're a you know, global corporation, um, you know, you can absorb a lot more than say the, you know, the card shop uh, that's really dependent upon that one market. Now, that one card shop that's dependent upon that one market depends on what market they're in. If they're in San Francisco, maybe not having an opinion has a greater cost than say if they're in you know Bessemer, Alabama, then not having an opinion would probably be you know preferable. So so a lot of it is is contextual. I don't know. There's not an always or never uh, kind of equation in this. But uh, what I always advise people is is to you know kind of three things you know which is you know be deliberate. And um, I think that's the first thing is a lot of people find themselves sort of caught up in the emotions or the rhetoric of a moment. And they find themselves putting their brand into that uh, without necessarily realizing what the full potential cost or consequences that are. It's really popular on Twitter right now. So it seems like a good thing. And I'm going to hang that sign in my door. And that's OK. You know, if you feel so passionately about an issue that you're willing to risk your brand, you're willing to take those risks, that's completely your choice. I do think it's a tragedy, though, when people you know, risk brands that they've built up. Uh, without really being thoughtful or even being that committed to the issue and they pay the price and they don't really get, um, you know, what they, what I think they thought they were getting. What about, um, so you mentioned the, the, uh, if you don't agree with me, you're evil. And, and that was actually something I was really curious about thinking about our conversation coming up today was it feels like you can't have an, an open discussion um, around any of these issues. You know, like, you know, if you're talking about abortion, you know, people who are against abortion or, you know, they just, they don't want women to have a right to choose. They're just putting them, you know, in a, in a you know, keep trying to keep them down. I mean, I don't know, like whatever it is, or if you don't, if you don't believe in, you know, police reform, you must be a racist. You know, it's very like, it's hard to argue when it's such an emotional response because, you know, what do you do with, uh, you know, uh, no, I'm not a racist. How do I prove, you know, how do you prove that? How um, do you prove a negative? You know, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, how, how, you know, what advice do you have about kind of um, you know, maybe taking the emotion out and getting to the real problem or, or what is your advice in just in general in this area? Well, I think, I think for, you know, for businesses, it's, it's the advice is the same, be deliberate, you got to decide whether you even should be having this conversation uh, or not. Uh, but you know, to your point about kind of the, the emotion of it, that that's, that's all by design. You know, when they say, if you don't agree with this, then you're that, that is not designed to be a conversation. In fact, it's designed to shut down a conversation. It's designed to avoid any kind of a substantive debate over that issue and control the dialogue to the point that um, if I, I call you the nastiest name and you don't have a comeback, I win. And so I think there's a venue issue in that. Like Twitter is not the place you're not gonna have, you know, there's no, no place for nuance in that. Um, and I think a lot of people find that with their businesses and putting their brands into the, into the political causes there's not room for nuance uh, because you have to realize that if you even if you feel passionately about an issue and you want to use your business as a vehicle, uh, you know, to address that issue, the moment you do, you made yourself a political combatant, you made your business a political combatant and are now subject to all the rules to your now, you know, you no longer have the, you know, Red Cross on your back or the, you know, the press credentials. You are now a combatant, you have a gun and people will shoot back. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a venue thing. 
Um, and so um, the first the first advice would be, you know, should you even be having the conversation? If you're in a place where, say, you've got to make policy decisions, you know, around your business where you're going to have to engage these issues, uh, you know, the second thing I always advise people is to be informed. You know, what you don't want to be is trying to rebut that, you know, uh, hyperbolic kind of ad hominem attack with 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 no substance. Um, and so be informed. And, you know, a lot of times you when people sort of glom on to the narrative of the moment, they're not particularly informed about that issue or that policy. They're just going with the ethos of the moment. And you see that in Georgia, you know, with the all star game. You know, everybody got on board with with this narrative about the legislation was going to, you know, Jim Crow 2.0 and it was going to restrict voting. And, you know, it was just, you know, the apocalypse and the all star game pulled out of Georgia, went to a state, I believe it was Colorado, that has more restrictive voting laws than than the than the legislation in Georgia was allowing for. And so in a case like that, now you just look hypocritical. You look like a, a political ap- actor and not uh, someone who's, who's meaningfully trying to do to good. Uh, so be, be informed uh, about the details of it. Uh, but the last part of, you know, once you're informed is be prepared. Um, you have to pick universal values, you know, freedom, equality, transparency, uh, due process. And if you stand on those values, um, and do not yield from those values, then um, then you'll endure you know that moment of that storm. So if you're you know you're forced to make a policy decision around in your company around you know one of these hot button issues, whether it's abortion or whatever, you pick the standards and the values you're going to live by, and you stick with them because those are the defensible things, and that's what keeps you out of the the mud. Yeah, it seems like it would be, you know, it, it seems like there's a lot of instances though where it feels like employees are forcing companies to have an opinion um, on on things, especially maybe in uh, more of the, um, you know, uh, LGBT space or, you know, um, or like during the, the riots with George Floyd, you know, and like, well, what are we going to do about it? Um, and so some of those things I think would be even hard to get ahead of, right? Because some of them are, I guess, instigated by events, um, you know, about, well, what's our opinion on this or do we care or whatever? And so, you know, what are your, your thoughts about that? Like if, if uh, your employees are sort of holding you hostage, um, what recommendations do you have? Well, I think I think that is part of being prepared, though. Is mm-hmm. first of all, you set expect you set expectations, um, you know, by your policies and by the standards and that you've set, even before that happens. You know, so if your if your standards and your policies are we don't take positions or you know whatever your standards are you've set for your company, when those events happen, you now follow through on those standards, and so you've set expectations. Um, you've also set a parameters of what your company should be expected, what standards your company should be, be expected to meet in that moment. And I, I think a good example of that is Netflix. Um, you know, back when the, you had the Chappelle, the big blow up around Chappelle and, you know, Netflix was really kind of all over the place in that moment. Um, but they ultimately, you know, stood with Chappelle. And I think, you know, in large part, you know, that, that would have pretty, you know, there were a lot of financial incentives to stand with Chappelle, uh, you know, for Netflix. But in the aftermath of that, what they've done recently is say, hey, look, here, here's what our standards are. We're about creativity. We're about this. We're about that. And if you're not with that, then this is not the place for you. And I think, in, 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 and then beyond that, you know, I was like a hundred and something they let go. Of, of people that, you know, were not aligned with, with that, the people that, and they're not telling them you should be aligned with us. They're saying, here's who we are, what we're going to do and how we're going to operate. If that bothers you, we're not changing. If that yeah. bothers you, then maybe this isn't the place for you. And, uh, you know, and so that's what, I think that's a really clear example of, of setting the standards and setting expectations and then following through with that. It was very refreshing, you know, and that could go both ways, right? You could, you, the, you know, Netflix could be creating documentary, you know, around the 
creativity space that's that's really on the you know um, opposite side of things, and it's saying the same messages to people who don't agree with those things. It's like we're just producing things. You're here to right. do your job. Well, um, and there, and it, yeah, and there's two different two different you know audiences in that. One is the the employees that work there, and you know they're you know do the, you have the right to dictate policy for our company? You know, but the other is a market equation. You know, if you're making products that people find offensive, um, you'll pay a market price for that. And the people that don't find offensive will reward you with that. And you, you make a market decision of, you know, aside from your own morals, right? So you may make a moral decision that says, I don't care what the market ramifications are, I'm going to do this. And if that's your choice, that's fine. But, you know, if you're, you know, if you're making a market-based decision, then you're going to make a calculus that says being, you know, you know, this way is going to make me more money than being that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's sort of the importance of, of the Disney lesson is that calculus, that calculus is changing a little bit. Cause I think pretty consistently it's been the money, you know, I make more money by doing this. Um, and now there's like, mm, there may be some cost on the other side of that, that we need to consider. Mm. Yeah. And well, and, and oftentimes I just, I often wonder if it's necessary to be as extreme as some of these companies are. It's like you could support groups without maybe taking such a rigid, you know, risky stance. But I mean, I guess if you're trying well, to change the rule, world, the risk is necessary. And, that, and, that, and that's the distinction, right? So you take a corporation, take a corporation like Netflix. I, I don't suspect Netflix has changed any of their corporate policies about sexual orientation or, you know, trans employees or benefits to those trans employees, right? What changed was their policy about how they're going to make decisions in their business. We're not going to censor. We're not going to, we're going to promote creativity. That's our standard. Um, And so they are, you know, very much, I think I would argue in a line with a lot of the the policies that I think, you know, the, the people that were upset with Chappelle, you know, want, but that's separate and apart from what the employees are asking to do is to take those values and those standards and project them to force them on other people to actively be coercive with other people. Same way with like Disney, you know, whatever policies Disney has is one thing, but they're now entering the field to try and change law that governs other people's lives. They're trying to, to project that um, yeah. onto others. And that's a completely different position uh, on the battlefield. Mm, absolutely. You know, I also think though that, you know, going back to that co- you know, our, uh, brief comments about how the conversations are designed to be shut down, you know, cause it's hard to argue with. I was remembering I did watch a Netflix documentary. Um, and I think it came out of Evergreen State College where the professor, you know, it was some sort of like day of absence where- um, Weinstein, they were changing, Weinstein. Yeah, yeah, they were changing their policy. And then, and then he got, for people who haven't heard about it, you know, he, he refused to not go to school. It was requested that people who weren't Caucasian that day, I think, were to not go to, or who were Caucasian, were not supposed to go to school that day so that, you know, they could feel what it was like um, uh, to be discriminated against, I guess, something like that. And then he he went to school anyway, because he thought that was kind of wrong. And, you know, he got trapped in a classroom or, or a lunchroom or something by all these students. And it, it was kind of scary and little violent do you think uh, social media is driving that I guess lack of um, respect and social decorum and like it just seems like things are getting more and more violent I guess is where I'm headed with that it, it is and it, it, it in some ways um, and, and and that's in part because um, those in authority the institutions and individuals and places of authority are not um, condemning it. Mm. I mean, you take, for instance, um, all of the, um, what's going on around the Supreme court around abortion, Mm. you know, where they're, you know, people are protesting and, and outside of the, the justices homes and it's against federal law to do that. Um, literally an illegal act. And, you know, when asked about it, um, you know, the, the, the president's press secretary would not even say it shouldn't be happening. Mm-hmm. You know, when you had 
um, you know, buildings burning and, and businesses being destroyed a couple of summers ago, no one was willing to say this is wrong for fear of feeling like they would be out of line with the, the underlying um, issue. You know, and it's one thing to say, look, this was horrible. The man was murdered. It was, you know, we've got to address this, whatever. You should be able to say that while also saying we shouldn't be burning things down and, and you know, people dying and losing their livelihoods. Uh, that's not an acceptable way to address it. But when you have sort of positions of power and authority in media and no one else, no, you know, they're no longer sort of condemning it, um, then you get more of it. You know, if you want more of something, you reward it. And um, I think that's, that's a part of it. It's, it's, a, it's a failure of, of leadership, I think, at, at many levels. Um, and, you know, we'll see. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in the corrective uh, nature of America. Uh, as long as Americans have the right to vote, um, you know, you'll, you'll, America corrects itself. And you may not get all the way back to kind of what you might have viewed as as you know utopia or whatever but um you know there's always a corrective thing in america the pressures in america always towards the center the pressure is always towards the center the the extremes are always trying to pull but the natural pressure of where most americans are is somewhere closer to the to the center now the center shifts right um you know the center of what and as the two um two extremes get more extreme, that center, you know, moves along with it. Uh, but the pressures are always towards the center because ultimately, you know, most Americans aren't ideologues. Most Americans aren't reading, you know, Ayn Rand or Noam Chomsky. You know, most Americans are just, you know, trying to raise their kids, pay their bills, you know, get a good retirement, you know, benefit their community, have family, you know, they're just, they're trying to live. And that's where, that's where most people are. Um, and that those things just don't comport with these these sort of extremes that are out there. And so that's why you have these corrective elections. And I think you're about to see the nation send a pretty significant message uh, in, in November about the direction that that a majority of the public wants to go. Hmm. Do you think, though, that, well, you know, so something that came I've been seeing a lot on social media and, and um and obviously social media is not the place to get your <laughs> news or anything, but, but I'd just be curious if, if you've seen the statement and what your thought is uh, about it is, it, you know, it was something about, um, you know, the majority of Germans didn't necessarily agree with Hitler. It was the act of not doing anything that led to, you know, kind of his rise in power and his, um, and then, you know, what then subsequently happened to, to, you know, the death of so many, um, Jews and, and people who didn't align with his um, ideology. So do you do you find that statement to be true that like many of us are just kind of afraid to maybe engage because, you know, and, and so instead we're just um, quiet or what are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, what is it, um, you know, all it takes is for, for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing, I think is, is right, is exactly. Old, old yeah. quote. Um, and, um, but, you know, it depends on what you mean by, by do something, um, you know, in America, there's a lot of ways to do something. You don't necessarily need to be, um, you know, picketing or, you know, publicly burning, you know, blowing up your aunt on Twitter, uh, to, to, to be doing something right in your own life, the decisions you make, what you will or won't do, where you shop, how you go. Uh, and how you vote, you know, and that's the power of, I think, of the, of the voting booth in America is, is, is you know, that is a, a very big act in and of itself, uh, choosing your leaders, not only nationally, but, but locally in your city council, in your school boards, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of that now, and you are seeing sort of an uprising. You're seeing a lot of people who, a lot of moms, a lot of parents, people are engaging, they're running for school board and taking over the school boards because they're unhappy with the direction uh, that that's been going. And, you know, I would, I would also, you know, remind you that when you, when you think back to the American Revolution, um, it was a, a roughly a third. There was a third of, of Americans that were for it, a third that were against it, and a third that didn't care. 
Mm. And so you had kind of those two thirds, you know, those two thirds fighting over it. And, um, you know, I also think about like history, history gets kind of written, you know, when you look back as this, that it's, it's almost like that Martin Luther King Jr., you know, the arc of history bends towards, towards justice, that, that the, every moment in history happened and came out the way it happened because that was the only way it could have come, you know, come out. It had to happen that way. Uh, but that's not true. The reality is, is every moment in history is contingent. You know, Hitler could have won. Germany could have won World War One or World War Two. The South could have won. You know, the Civil War. Uh, there was, you know, every sort of significant. You know, Britain could have could have defeated uh, the Continental Congress or the Continental Army. And you know, every moment was contingent. But when you think about it, how few people it was actually contingent upon. You know, you had you know the the people the the Thomas Jeffersons and the John Adams and the the people of the world, the George George Washingtons, in every moment in history, it's a it's a relatively small group of people that drive you know the outcome, um, and then the masses kind of pick a side and and either go along in a third, a third, and a third. And so when we look at th this moment in history, when it seems like so overwhelmingly one direction, along comes one man, Elon Musk. One man, mm -hmm. Elon Musk, with one bid completely reshapes the conversation around free speech and censorship and has, you know, they, Twitter did their, their, you know, their investors call yesterday. He doesn't even own Twitter yet, but every CEO, every executive in there is singing off of his song sheet about censorship and, and the public square and, and what their duties are. Um, and so we live in this moment where things do move fast and they can change, you know, change quickly. And um, so there's a lot of different ways, I think, from voting for your city council to buying Twitter, that you see people reacting to the conditions around them and, um, you know, are, are trying to move towards a correction. You know, it's, you know, I also would assume there's a lot of power and, and you briefly mentioned it in your list, but the power of purchasing as well, you know, um, like I know, I know uh, Chick Fil A goes under fire a lot, um, you, you know, for not for you know not donate well for donating to parties that are against um, same sex relationships and things like that. But kind of like you say, they they still treat everybody the same way. They still have this, you know their policies inside the company um, are supportive of individuals, but their their outward reflection is we feel this way. So anyway, that said, you know, they've come on, they've been targeted a lot. And yet, you know, I think they're then supported though by so many other people that, the, you know, that target, I don't think has had a big impact on the bottom line as, you know, some of these other companies who take the wrong stance and, and lose significant market share. I mean, do you, do, have you seen that? And what are your thoughts about, you know, the power of the dollar? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's obviously there. Um, I mean, you see it all of the time. In fact, it's, you know, I, I would argue that when you think about, you know, corporations that have made decisions that do align with the, the, the dominant narrative, you know, as opposed to maybe Chick-fil-A that's made decisions that don't, you, those, are, those are dollars and cents decisions as well. Um, you know, I, I'm, I've never been a huge fan of like the boycott uh, it's just very difficult for that to make, uh, you know, as some sort of an organized difference. Um, but at the end of the day, individuals just saying, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give my money to those people does add up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's a tricky equation, right? Is do you believe so fervently about, do you want like to really make a point by not giving these people money or do you want cheap toilet paper? What decisions you make as a consumer? That's why these sort of boycott things um, aren't nearly as effective as a as sort of a defined political tactic. But I think as a market based um, uh, concept, you know, to the extent that people, you know, your actions rise to a level that people are just no longer willing to tolerate, there will be a price to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's interesting you said that because you know I know I know um, there was a lot of boycotting of Disney and and Walmart and companies like that maybe in the late '90s, early 2000s. But I think what you find is 
it becomes very hard to boycott those companies anyway, because they're so large that sometimes you don't even know when you're purchasing from them. You might, you might boycott Disney as the, like the entity Disney, but that, you know, their, their investment portfolio is huge. And still, you know, they're still profiting even if you are boycotting them. Yeah. My, my theory though is, is that, you know, where these companies really, you know, there, there are some instances I think where, people really do damage to their brand um, and that that has real economic consequences to it. And there are some instances of that uh, that are out there. I mean, if you, you look at it like, take, you know, set kind of the cultural stuff aside, you look at it like, uh, you remember Firestone, right? When their, you know, cars were flipping over or whatever, right? That's brand damage. There was an economic consequence to that. And so the question is, is are your political actions creating that level of brand damage or is it sort of somewhere down here? But I think we're, we're ultimately these corporations that kind of become so focused on the cultural side of things um, ultimately suffer the economic penalties. And this is just a theory, is that when those things become your guiding light and not the core business functions of customer service, product, you know, focusing on your product, the quality of your services, the quality of your customer's experience falls because you've made this the greater priority. This is what's guiding your business and not quality product or customer service. And there is absolutely uh, an economic consequence to that. Hmm. Yeah, you got to remember you're there to, to do business, not just to be a, yeah. a social entity. Um, would be curious about, you know, uh, what some of the biggest mistakes you've seen companies make then are, you know, the ones that have gotten, gotten them into the position where it's had the most damage um, or, you know, maybe even, you know, so it went so far as to put them out of business. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, it depends on kind of which which side of the coin you look at. I mean, at Disney is obviously, I think, the, the, the most current and sort of accurate and clear example of that. I mean, it, it's costing them significantly. Uh, but I also think Disney is, is an example of the other thing as well, not, not just the, the cost of their political actions. But I because I, I think what, what Disney did and in the moment they did it in, it's also at a time where I think they caused a lot of families to look at it and say, you know, Disney used to be the happiest place on earth. Is that really what they're about now? You know, you take your kids down there and, you know, you got two kids, it's going to cost you five grand. You know, it's, it, it's a, it's a giant kind of corporate is, is being, is kids and your enjoyment and their enjoyment and being the happiest place on earth. Is that still what's driving? Is that still what defines Disney? And I think, you know, when people take these actions and, you know, they kind of cause people to reflect and say, maybe Disney isn't that what it's about. Maybe uh, politics aside, maybe I don't want to, you know, maybe Disney isn't really what it used to be anyway. So maybe we'll just take a pass this year. Um, and, you know, and so I think there's, there's a lot of consequences in that, that, that go along with both the political consequences, as well as kind of the, the, the definitional consequences of becoming something other than, uh, what you're supposed to be or focusing on things other than your core business. And, uh, you know, the other side of that are, you know, people that uh, run afoul of the dominant narrative. And, you know, you have to look at, say, you know, like a parlor, you know, where, you know, they got out and they ran afoul of the dominant narrative and Amazon shut them down. And they're pretty much, you know, out of existence. And they were really on the ascendant in that moment um, and, you know, after January 6th and, and Trump and all of that, and, you know, the, they took away their ability, I mean, physically took away their ability to, uh, you know, to compete. Um, I think that, another one I would look at media, is, Wait, that's the social media site yeah, parlor? Yeah, social yeah. media parlor. And they, they just never, they've never recovered um, from, from, you know, to, to where they were. Uh, the other one I would look at is um, Duck, Duck, Go, you know? They, they've, they've in, invested um, tremendous amounts of you know, money. They're running TV ads with, uh, and it's actually quite a clever commercial of, uh, you know, it's, it's that, uh, was it the police? You know, every, every step you take, I'll be watching you. 
and it's, you know, it's the, the, the actor in a Google shirt overlook, over looking over someone's shoulder, their whole spiel is we don't track you, we're, you know, we're free information. And, you know, you know, a few weeks back, the CEO kind of went on this diatribe about how they are censoring information, how they're deprioritizing stuff. Uh, he kind of got caught up in the, the uh, emotion and fervor around Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, and, and with, with a series of just two or three tweets, they cost their brand unimaginable damage. Now, they're not out of business or whatever else, but that, I mean, there was a, a very, very real consequence to that because they're suddenly doing something that's antithetical to the brand that you've built. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a tough situation to, to, to be in, but yeah, yeah if you say you are you, uh, something, then, you have to be true to it. And, and those search engines, those search engines are, you know, as much as, you know, I think a lot of people have questions about, you know, their own um, social responsibility and whether or not they're acting above board and how much they're putting their finger on the scale and all that stuff. To be fair to them, too, there is immense pressure out of the security state, out of the U.S. government, you know, particularly around, you know, when, when you've got. United States of America pushing propaganda out, information warfare, Russia, everybody in this, you know, around this environment, it's, it's a huge information warfare environment. And, you know, when, when the U.S. government comes knocking and saying, hey, you're helping Russia, that's, that's a pretty difficult place to, pretty, pretty difficult place to be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, Jim, I'd love to hear kind of the three things you want to leave top of mind for the audience. Yeah, I, I think, you know, be, be deliberate. Don't walk blindly into anything. Make deliberate choices with your eyes wide open about what the costs, the benefits, and the potential consequences are. Um, be informed. Make sure you know what you're talking about. Um, make sure it's meaningful. Um, if you decide to engage your brand into the public domain, into the public policy domain, make sure, you're, make sure you know what you're talking about. You're not just regurgitating the latest talking point or latest talking head and then be prepared, you know, pick your values, pick your standards, stick with them, don't back down. Uh, because if you do, you know, on either side, either side of the, of the, of, of, of any fight, um, once you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound and they'll, it'll never be enough. Um, if you adopt other people's standards then you have to adopt them all. Uh, so that would be the, the, you know, kind of the, the, the three points I would say, uh, but, you know, at the same time, this is all, these are all choices. You know, there are very few um, people that find themselves in these positions um, who didn't have a choice, whether it was a choice to actively engage or whether it was a choice to prepare and be thoughtful and to understand that everything is public and everything is political. So when you're writing your new policies for your company, you need to be thinking through when, when my employee tweets this out, how's this going to roll? How do I, how does this policy comport with the standards I've decided I want to stand on and I'll be able to defend it. And so, uh, so whether it's by a choice of to actively enter the field or by uh, a failure to, to be prepared, uh, it's still a choice. And so I think most people uh, should not, you know, live in fear of these things if they just do these three simple things. Oh, that's great advice. Um, and how can people find out more about what you do or get in contact with you? Our website would be the best way. It's www.tdspublicaffairs, and that's Tango Delta Sierra, tdspublicaffairs.com. Um, shares information about what we do, what we can, how we can help. Um, you know, we help people tell their story and solve problems. And, um, you know, there's not much we can't, can't help with in the, in the communications field, uh, whether that is a, you know, developing a strategy for rolling out your next policy or even developing your next policy. Um, we can offer the perspective on, you know, the political and communications implications of that, uh, or whether you find yourself in a firefight and you need someone to help navigate that. Uh, we're, we're here and ready to help. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time, uh, Jim, today. All righty. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And to our audience, until next time, keep your organizations. Hey, so tomorrow.